This is Doc Vader, the most powerful clinician in the galaxy. You are listening to the Inside the Boards podcast. The force is moderately to severely strong with this one. Vader out. Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer, so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. Welcome back to the Inside the Boards podcast. I'm Stuart Bryant. Uh, Today, I just wanted to let you guys know that Patrick and I are going to discuss a respiratory infection and uh, go into a little more detail than we probably should, but um hopefully it will help you guys with this particular bug i hope you all enjoy all right welcome to the inside the boards podcast we are checking in uh it's me patrick beeman your host with our co-host and producer Stuart bryant um we've been kind of in the background, planning some material for this year's Study Smarter series for step one. So stay tuned for more info on that. Um, working out some significant uh, production uh, delaying uh, kinks with the audio cue bank um, with solutions uh, forthcoming uh, on that. But I will say we've uh, resumed recording uh, items. So if you are interested in the all audio cue bank for either step one or for your clerkships or step two, head over to insidetheboards.com. We are working with a number of great companies to produce some awesome content. And we're getting pretty positive reviews all the time. Like people are like, hey, now I can study in my car, which you know, that's helpful if you're a medical student, you have no time. Um, so we've got some help from Lecturio and Online MedEd and Osmosis with our audio cue bank. And you can learn more about it on our website, insidetheboards.com. Stuart, how's it going? It is going. It's really Halfway busy. through second year. Yeah. Halfway, yeah. Uh, more than halfway. A little more. You get to take, yeah. you get to take step one uh, in a few months. I know, and I'm kind of excited, freaked out and excited and trying to figure out what I'm going to do and what I need to start right now and what I need to save for later, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, all right. So, what's your uh, school's program like? Uh, when uh, When are you actually finished with classes? Ooh, we're finished, like, I'm going to say the first week of May. And we're supposed to be done with our exam by the end of June. So okay. I want to say I have six weeks to prepare and um, hopefully that's enough for us, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's probably the average too, I would say. Um, but what what have you done thus far? Like, uh, are you still occasionally like looking back at some anatomy stuff or neuroanatomy stuff or... I mean, so at this point, what I'm really doing is first and foremost, working on the material that I have in school right now. You know, um, they set up the curriculum to where some of the highest yield material is this semester. And you can say that's a good thing because you're learning it just before your boards, or you could say it's a bad thing because you're learning it just before your boards. (laughs) Um, but you know, right now I'm really trying to dig in on the material. So this test that we have coming up is on, um, you know, cardiovascular, pulmonary, renal, and how they all integrate together. And like, those are huge systems to be learning and pulling together for a, a, a test. Uh, yes, actually, I, I will say uh, I am working on a, a project with a company. Um, uh, it's super secret. It's actually not that much of a secret, but I'll leave the mystery uh, for now. 
But it involved uh, me needing to review a lot of material from the first and second year of uh, med school. So, like, I purchased uh, Costanza's physiology textbook and nice. um, opened up my Robbins and pulled out Katzing and Trevor's pharmacology review. And I've got Micro Made Ridiculously Simple on my desk and a few others, right? <laughs> um, and I was going through respiratory uh, physiology path pharmacology all that stuff um and my mind was blown uh <laughs> and then that was after spending a good uh week or two in renal oh and my gosh learning reviewing that like from the glomerulus up and i was like just continually shocked i'm like i number one can't believe i learned all this stuff number two I can't believe how much of it is completely ir well it's completely irrelevant or at least ignorable um Oops. as a <laughs> as a practicing physician, you know, an OBGYN. There's so many things it, it seems like half of what you're required to know and on on, on the test or just uh to to pass uh your boards is superfluous, quite frankly. It seems that way, right? And an argument can be made as to why that's not the case. But from my perspective, the breadth of material is just astonishing, astounding. And no wonder people are overwhelmed because you really can't learn it all. Oh, yeah. Like, y you just can't. And that's why I think, you know, the approach you have to take is is to learn it, meaning like you've internalized it and maybe some of the details remain fuzzy and then to review it to a appropriate depth, which um, is what the goal of a lot of the uh, review companies out there and our podcast to a certain extent um, exists for. And that is to help you know how deep you need to go to know, say, respiratory pharmacology or whatever, um, physiology for step one, um, because that's a lot different than, say, what you would need to know from the respiratory system if you were a pulmonologist. Um, <laughs> so my heart goes out to you. I don't envy you. Well, kudos to you for digging back into that material when you are far removed from it and only have to for your own personal enlightenment. <laughs> like I, I await that day, but for now, just digging into the material myself and trying to make sure I know that. And then I'm probably trying to do, I don't know, if I, if I haven't done 10 questions, like 10 vignette style questions and like added material, like I've probably messed up somewhere in, along the day. Um, okay. So that's kind of like your kind of keep it fresh in the background kind of study plan. Yeah. And, and, you know, usually I try to grab questions that are, you know, at least pertinent to whatever system I'm doing. So, y you know, you're talking about doing anatomy to keep that fresh. And so, um, you know, maybe I'm doing cardiovascular anatomy questions um, and cardiovascular biochemistry questions and some of that physiology stuff. And it all kind of integrates and, I think it helps me, you know, helps jog my memory when I'm actually learning the the path and the high yield material, like the pharmacology and stuff. And that, that all gets brought back up, um, but this kind of helps you add that extra little layer to it while you're studying. Well, let's go through some questions. First, we got a 33-year-old man comes to the emergency department because of... Shortness of breath, myalgia, generalized weakness, and diarrhea for the past five days. His medical history includes kidney transplant a month prior for end-stage renal failure. His temperature is uh, 99.3 degrees Fahrenheit. Pulse is 110 beats per minute. Respirations are 22. And blood pressure is normal. Pulmonary auscultation shows inspiratory crackles at the left base. Blood cultures show a poorly staining, fastidious, gram-negative rod. Which of the following is the most likely method of transmission for the patient's infection? Is it A, contact with contaminated food, B, contact with contaminated water, C, fecal oral, D, insect bites, or E, person-to-person -person contact? 
All right, so let's break this down. Mm. So as somebody more comfortable with clinical stuff, immediately I'm thinking, ah, yes, I I know it. I know it. This is going to be easy, right? Before I get to the answer choices, I'm thinking, ah, it's Legionnaire's disease. It's got to be Legionnaire's disease. Got that poorly staining <laughs> fastidious gram negative rod. That's all I need. Um, so, and then it was kind of disappointing to read uh, the transmission um, uh, being the focus of that question. <laughs> so that that is almost uh, a point of memorization. Do you agree? Oh, yeah. But if you sat through any lecture on Legionnaire's disease or Legionella, you probably heard about the point of transmission, wouldn't you say? Yeah, definitely. The, your, you know, your kid, like, who has a bedroom or, like, sleeps in a tent outside next to an air conditioner that has is malfunctioning, has developed like puddles under it that, you know, they come up with all these weird scenarios where um, you can get uh, standing water or, um, uh, and and I guess they're not really weird because the famous uh, case for Legionnaires was a, um, was an American Legion conference or something hotel exactly. where the air conditioner system got contaminated by this bug and... At any rate, yes, of course, yes, you'd hear that. <laughs> so, so you hear something about cooling water, water and yeah. water vapor or, you know, something along that line just to – and once you've heard, you know, water vapor, does your mind go to anything other than Legionella? <laughs> no, which is a great point because I – you know, like, do as an OBGYN, do I have to worry about Legionnaire's disease? Not really. Like, somebody has, if I can get to pneumonia um, in clinical practice, I can usually get help from a colleague, and I probably would, um, depending on the practice setting, um, you know, if somebody needs hospitalized right. um, or is presenting to the emergency department with primarily um, cardiopulmonary symptoms like I'm not the best person uh, to be taking care of them, right? <laughs> Fair enough. It's going to be, uh, you know, somebody with some critical care expertise who can stabilize them um, if they are indeed un unstable. So, um, but my knee jerk reflex, my, you know, my hunch reflex, as I've uh, written about before, is, is, yeah, water, legionnaires. And then I just have to remember, well, how does legionnaires present? Oh, it's a pneumonia, right? Um, but it also has this unique uh, feature of uh, uh, GI involvement, if I recall. Um, is that true? I I believe so. Uh, you know, you get like a, I, I don't know, I feel like you feel sore and then you get diarrhea and you kind of think it looks like the flu. And then later on, you, you've got these, you know, uh, gram staining bacteria and you're like oh okay that's not the flu right uh no in <laughs> fact the flu um despite how far i am from uh, uh first and second year in medical school um i do know the flu is caused by a virus yeah <laughs> oh wow it's <laughs> a shocker so i am gonna check you on one thing yeah please. so this sh you know we were we we're talking about water vapor and um, bacteria. And the other one that I do have come to mind, and it could be kind of similar, but probably not, is going to be Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas. Yeah. Ah, I know. So, okay, good. It, but it's not going to be poorly staining, and it's not fastidious. It will grow if you plate it. Okay. So, <laughs> is that what... So if I'm a new, if I'm a first year medical student listen, listening to this and maybe we haven't gone through any micro stuff yet and it says fastidious, what are they trying to communicate? Or if you're an attending, yeah, so uh, far removed from this. Fastidious is just the medical jargon for a fickle, complicated, it needs very select environment in order to grow. Um, so, I think the one for Legionella is that it needs to be on a charcoal media 
and it needs iron and cysteine in order to to grow properly. And that is not like, um, you know, easier to grow bacteria that you just put on put on a blood auger or a chocolate auger, and they just grow. And I think that was one of the issues with, you know, isolating the disease uh, when it was first encountered or first recognized. Uh, all I got right from this, uh, from microbiology made ridiculously simple, is just that it uh, gets its name for causing an outbreak of pneumonia at an American Legion convention in Philadelphia in 1976. <laughs> so... I haven't, I haven't got much more than that, but, um, uh, but the, the note is made that, uh, the organism lives everywhere in natural and man-made water environments, but aerosolizing the contaminated water, um, gives the potential for it to be inhaled. And I remember this because it is such a tiny little thing, right? Um, your nose hair is not going to filter it out. It's bacteria. And then you're going to get down deep, deep, deep into the terminal bronchioles where the alveoli live. And some of these bugs are going to slip past your uh, second line of defense or, I guess, mechanical line of defense in the respiratory tract, which is your mucociliary elevator. Does that sound... Like I know what I'm talking about? It sounds like you do know what you're talking about. Like vaguely? Yeah. Like vaguely. Um, (laughs) And so that can, that means it can, it's not going to have like an upper respiratory, I guess, disease. Maybe some of that we can edit out. But yeah, um, (laughs) if you look up one of my favorite textbooks for learning micro, which is uh, microbiology made ridiculously simple, uh, Note is made that there are a few distinguishing elements of Legionnaire's disease or Legionella uh, pneumonia that is different from your garden variety pneumococcal pneumonia, okay? So the unusual clinical elements you want to remember are um, the fever with pulse temperature dissociation, all right? High fever, low heart rate. Low heart rate. Ugh. Yeah, which is kind of disappointing because the question had his heart rate at high. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So it's not quite, uh, you know, fulminant uh, septic shock level uh, uh, tachycardia, but um, I mean, also the age range is wrong. So we have a 32 year old, (laughs) uh, but he did have a kidney transplant. So that would make him immunocompromised. So it'd be more likely for him to get something like Legionella. Yeah, that that's absolutely true. Um, what about uh, some other kind of like high yield associations um, from Micromate? Ridiculously simple. I'll give you these, okay? So you got pneumonia and somebody who also has rhabdo at the same time where you see like elevated serum creatine kinase. Um, that should make you think the Legionella. Um uh, pneumonia with transaminitis, elevated AST ALT. Mm. That should make you think Legionella. Um, and, uh, diarrhea and abdominal pain also kind of do distinguish it from your garden variety, uh, pneumonias as well. Um, and that's what so, makes it atypical is it's got diarrhea, muscle weakness. So, uh, if you didn't hear anything about the pneumonia, you'd probably be thinking, oh, this person might have the flu or something. And man, and so you're gonna kill you're gonna kill it on step one because this final paragraph on uh, Legionella in Micro Made Ridiculously Simple says sometimes the systemic symptoms like fever, myalgias, confusion, abdominal pain, and diarrhea precede the lung symptoms, leading to misdiagnosis of influenza or an acute abdomen. Mm-hmm. See, you're gonna crush it, man. Hopefully, yeah, that's the that's the goal, man. So, the other thing is uh, the silver stain. You, that's going to be the main way to visualize Legionella. Um, so, if, they talk, if they're talking about seeing it on a silver stain, I think that's going to be helpful. In this vignette, they don't talk about staining it. They just talk about it's a gram-negative rod. How do you know it's a gram-negative rod? 
if it poorly stains. Um, I think that this is one of those, um, one of those bugs that gets, uh, categorized into like gram negative by some books, but other bacteria in other books, um, like, uh, like chlamydia to a certain extent, because what, uh, it's an, what am I looking for? A, like a facultative intracellular infecting alveolar macrophages? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I think this is kind of a pimping question, but it's a, whether or not you can treat it with penic- penicillins or beta-lactamase drugs. Which you really can't. Right. Makes sense. Yes, but <laughs> would you... I guess what I'm saying is that, that doesn't seem immediately obvious to me, but it's one of those things where if you kind of look at the material in a little bit different way, you're kind of like, oh, yeah, that might be another way to remember a few different things, right? So, um, gram negatives, they have what? This thin wall. Uh, you can't really attack the wall to attack the bug, and beta lactam drugs rely essentially on attacking the bacterial cell wall, right? Which is big and thick and gram positive. So that's all mm-hmm. correct. Correct. Um, so with Legionella, thin wall, therefore not treated with beta lactams, treated instead with like uh, uh, fluoroquinolones or azithromycin, right? Yeah. Like the other atypical kind of pneumonia bugs. Um it all does kind of make sense, but you draw out the connection there that, well, you know it's gram-negative too if it's not treated with beta-lactams, which atypical pneumonias are not, right? That's my understanding of it anyway. <laughs> so, this brings up a good point. Um, I am not a pharmacologist. I am not a respiratory physiologist or a pathologist. Um Stuart is not either, so far as I know, although he seems to know a lot he seems to know a lot more about uh basic science than I do. Um but I was a philosophy major and you were a biology major, right? Psych in history. You were a psych? Yeah. Psych and chemistry. How, oh I see, I knew there was a science in there. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> what? I knew it. Oh. Have we never talked about this? You were a psych major? Yeah, um, oh. I, I wanted What's to do it? neuroscience, and they didn't have that where I went. So All right. I was like, that's, that's another psychology. conversation. We will uh, we'll pick that up uh, one of these days. But you, you know, you're you bring up the point that sometimes, perhaps the way you remember things doesn't exactly match up with reality, right? Um, if it doesn't contradict reality it's still something useful as a way of thinking about or remembering something um it's a heuristic Heuristic. right (laughs) right so um these sorts of things especially the ones you come up with on your own like the things you look in the mirror or you know sit like a rodin sculpture of the thinker um, and just ponder, like, how how does this work? Why does this work? Um, those are the sorts of things that I think stick with you and can help you remember these um, items for a test. So, um, those are the connections you draw. Yeah. It's, um, and I know it's, no lie, it's not easy to do those in medical school because it's sort of, here's the material and here's how it is and just take it and memorize it. And really the focus on digesting it and kind of creating those uh, integrations doesn't happen until you get out of the classroom, I feel like. Yeah, I I bet a lot of them don't. Um, I would say, yeah, once you're out of the classroom and into the clinic and then, you know, you got more and more responsibility within um, medicine, your way of um, screening information um, and deciding what's important to keep at the forefront um, becomes that skill becomes uh, you know something you develop uh, more more with more ease. Um, but I was all over the place. Sorry, I'm uh, <laughs> no okay. Hopefully not one confusing more thing. You. Um, yeah, yeah. 
about Let, we were talking about Legionella, right? I think yes. at one point <laughs> we were. Um, I have this fun short list of things to think about with patients who are immunocompromised, not competent, right. compromised, and they have pneumonia. So okay. there are five so, things we've mentioned two of them already, and that's okay. Legionella and Pseudomonas. Absolutely. Got to remember those. Yeah. Methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Ah, yeah. It's a, a, a staph related pneumonia. And then viral pneumonia or fungal pneumonia. It's a good point. Um, see, so simple. Uh, all right. So I think that's an excellent kind of summary. So immunocompromised person with pneumonia, uh, what's the cause? You, I mean, if you're not a pulmonologist, if you remember these mm-hmm. kind of like five things, you're probably in pretty good shape yeah, for and, an exam. And, you know, two of those are an entire class of bugs, so it's not exactly going to get you too far. But if you need a short list for immunocompromised patients, you know, there you go. Yeah, absolutely. For this particular podcast, Legionella pneumonia, you've got immunocompromised host, you're at a greater risk for it. You need to remember you should probably associate air conditioning systems or like those little mist sprays um, for produce in the grocery store with uh, the transmissibility um, of the the bug. Um, it's a facultative intracellular uh, paras- or bacterium um, that infects alveolar macrophages treated with fluoroquinolones or um, azithromycin or doxycycline because it's an atypical cause of pneumonia. And uh, what are the other high-yield points you wanted to leave them with? A charcoal media and the silver stain. It needs iron and cysteine to grow because it's fastidious. The other thing I will say, this... I, I don't know how prominent this is a feature of uh, step one, but the um, one of the tests that's specific for Legionnaire's disease is a urine antigen. Um, uh, yeah, I wasn't going to talk about it. There, it's a thing. It's If the question is asking for, like, what's the fastest way you can get an answer, like, gold star, that's your answer, go home. But it's only, like, 60% specific the urine antigen test only detects legionella pneumophila sera group one but that's 90 percent of cases right (laughs) i just read that (laughs) no you're it does only do type one and uh that's the majority of cases but it may come back negative and they may still have legionella so it's not perfect as tests rarely are that's true. Um, but I guess one other takeaway then you could have is if you're testing someone's urine because of their pneumonia, you're probably dealing with Legionnaire's disease. I can't think of another urinary antigen that tests for like a pulmonary disease yet. Maybe I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, somebody please write me and... uh then you can come on the podcast and teach us about it. And on that note, uh, for you third years who are out there and crushed step one and thought to yourself, wow, I did, you know, really well. And I came up with a method that uniquely works. Get in touch with us. Send an email to podcast at insidetheboards.com. Get in touch with uh, Stuart or or me. And um, why don't we... Uh, use your expertise and advice for your uh, lower classmen if you are indeed listening to this. Um, what, do, what do we have coming up? Do we need to mention? I'm going to study for boards, so that's okay, going to be stu- exciting. You're going to study for boards, and I'm going to bring on some very entertaining guests uh, from Gomer Blog. Yes, you can use yeah. humor to study. Um, from Kaplan. 
um, and uh, of course some regulars who will be participating in our upcoming Step 1 Study Smarter series. If you are studying for Step 1, don't forget we have a whole archive of about two and a half months of weekly to three times weekly episodes um, aimed at kind of hitting the high yield points for your step one uh, dedicated study period. We're going to be repeating that series this year um, towards the beginning of March through May, um, perhaps with a little less ambitious scope, um, (laughs) but it will be just as high yield. And um, we wish you luck as you start thinking about uh, studying for step one. And um, you guys can always... uh, send Stuart well wishes too, because he will be uh, taking step one with you this year. Awesome. Also, uh, I forgot about this. I'm hoping to have a sit down with Greg Roden from the med school Fizz podcast. You know, it's like a, a, a good basic science podcast uh, for medical physiology. And he calls it the med school Fizz podcast. It's just abbreviated uh, P-H-Y-S. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but he does good little actual basic science walkthroughs, and he has some tie-ins for PATH and biochem yeah. and all that stuff. And he's doing some cardiovascular stuff right now, so I think we're going to try to do some cardiovascular questions when I can get the time to hopefully talk with him. <laughs> so, but you're, you're telling the audience they should listen to this podcast too. Definitely. And so it's med school fizz, med school fizz, P Y P H Y S. <laughs> Dude, you need to go to bed. I went for a run right before this. So I'm kind of like foggy. I'm really? not going to lie. I exercise too. I thought it would like boost my brain power, but actually I think, uh, it never... shunted all, all the blood to my muscles and, uh, not to my brain. It never works. Um, that way. yeah, I like that, uh, podcast. You sent me an episode. I listened to an example. It was pretty good. He also um, said that he listened to Golion and our podcast when he was like working out and stuff while studying for step one. So he endeared himself to me. I was like, ah, (laughs) I'm going to say he just compared us to Golion because that to me would mean uh, like that'd be so awesome because I love Golion. Um, So yeah, we should definitely have him on. Do it. Awesome. That's the plan. All right. Thanks for listening to the Inside the Boards podcast. Uh, We really appreciate it. A couple of orders of business. I need to make a few corrections to what I said. Back when we recorded this, I was doing 10 questions per day. Uh, Now it's closer to 40, so that's escalated a little bit. And that kind of is hitting off the beginning of my board review. On that note, you know, if anybody wants to help us with the podcast who has an interest in medicine and business and audio, uh, feel free to drop us a line. We need help with all sorts of things. <laughs> and as I'm going to be studying, that's going to be harder for me to be able to help, at least in the interim. Also, to I was talking about a little bit about the antibiotic susceptibility of different bugs and pathogens. I wanted to clarify that these are heuristics and not absolutes. There are occasional gram-negative bugs that are treated with penicillins. And uh, as the higher the generation goes of cephalosporins, uh, the more gram-negative susceptibility there is. You know, with resistance and everything, this actually becomes a much more complicated topic. Uh, But if you do know the drug that treats a bug, and that goes along with its either either gram-positive or gram-negative characteristic, you can really focus on learning one of those. And just remember that because of the drug used to treat it, it must be this kind of bug. So obviously that's not a rule or a law in microbiology, but that can help you on the test. The one other thing I wanted to mention was we were talking about the urine antigen test for Legionella. I was talking a little bit about how it's not that great of a test. And I said it was, I I referred to a low specificity. It has a high specificity. It has a low sensitivity. And I think it ranges from 60 to 90%. Just because you get a negative test doesn't mean you don't have Legionella in this case. But to Patrick's point, if you have a vignette that is talking about doing a urine antigen test uh, for a bug in a pneumonia patient, uh, that could be pretty helpful. All right. So 
Lastly, I, uh, like I was saying, if anybody is able to help us, we're looking for people who can help with web design or web development. You know, we need to update our web page and it's kind of gotten over the heads of Patrick or myself. You know, we need people to help with editing. <laughs> I mean, we need people to help with all sorts of things. So if there's anything that you have a particular knack for that you would be willing to lend your skills to our, our effort, feel free to contact us at podcast at inside the boards or info at inside the boards. And also, uh, we haven't really mentioned it in a while, but we do have a Facebook page. Uh, you can let us know all your thoughts and feelings about our podcast there. We have a Twitter and an Instagram. Feel free to follow us on those. If you haven't left us a rating on iTunes, please do. We could really use that. That helps us get more access to people so people see our podcast. But the way we titled it, it's actually kind of hard for people to find us uh, without a good ranking. So the more people who like it uh, and rate it on iTunes, the better chance we have of being seen by people in the medical community. Also, share us with our, your friends. Uh, that's a big help too. Uh, on that note, appreciate you guys listening and sticking around to the end. And uh, as always, happy studying. Thanks to Sam and Alex from Magic Man for letting us use the track Out of Mind off their 2014 album Before the Waves, which GQ described as 12 tracks of alt joy. To hear more, check them out at magicmanmusic.com or follow them on facebook.com slash magicmanmusic. As always, thanks for listening and sharing Inside the Boards with your friends. Inside the Boards is not affiliated with the United States Medical Licensing Examination, Comprehensive Osteopathic Medical Licensing Examination, National Board of Medical Examiners, National Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners, or any other licensing or examination body. All exam names or other trademarks are the property of the respective trademark owners. Content discussed during this program is the property of Inside the Boards, or the attributed owner and may not be reproduced without permission from the appropriate entity. Inside the Boards fully adheres to the respective policies on irregular behavior outlined by the aforementioned credentialing bodies. All content discussed is for educational purposes and should not be construed as medical advice.